So yeah, like Joe said, uh, my name is Justin Reynolds. Uh, I work at Netflix on the traffic and chaos team. Um, a little bit about that team, the traffic side of the team, we are responsible for um, moving traffic around the world. We're hosted in three different Amazon regions. Um, and if one region is having issues, the traffic team is responsible for moving uh, the traffic to one or two of the other healthy regions. And the chaos team uh, is responsible for purposefully breaking things during business hours uh, while there's engineers around to actually fix it and figure out what the problem is so that they don't break accidentally while we're all sleeping. Uh, my job personally on the team is to help understand the impact of the things that we do. Um, because we are purposefully affecting the Netflix experience for millions of users, we needed a way to get live feedback on hundreds of microservices um, in three different regions around the world. Um, so we did this idea of, of a proactive dashboard, proactive monitoring. Um, where most dashboards and graphs that we have seen are more for the use of reactive monitoring. You have been alerted, go look at the graph, see what's changed, see what lines up. Um, that line has changed. We, we can't do that. We are purposefully affecting millions of metrics. Um, so if we're looking for the line that changed, all of them have changed. Um, we need to figure out uh, which ones have changed that are actually going to potentially cause problems. Um, why is this such a hard problem? I'm going to get into that. Um, we're, I'll show you some of the dashboards that we actually that we have and we have used in the past and show you what we've come up with um, to solve this problem for our use case. Um, most visualizations that we all know and see are not meant to be started at in real time. Um, and they're useful for showing exact numbers um, and how they correlate with other metrics, which none of that is uh, important to us. We, we need to be able to know the now and not how it relates to the past. We just need to know how it feels and just take a quick glance and see something could be going wrong. Um, this is what started what we like to call intuition engineering. And our first uh, foray into this quote field um, we call visceral. Um, first I'm going to get into the whys. Um, I'm going to simplify this a little bit. If this whole process is very interesting to you. Uh, Luke, Luke Kosevsky on my team gave a great talk at QCon New York um, explaining in great detail um, our entire failover strategy and the multi-region architecture. Um, so a simple version, um, long years ago, uh, Netflix was in a data center. We moved into Amazon US East One um, and ran uh, the entire Netflix control plane out of there. Uh, as we started to grow and expand around the world, we opened a second, uh, did set up a second data center um, in EU West um, to serve our European customers because it was a very bad experience for them to be served out of the US. Um, but the one problem with this was that they were siloed. Users that were served out of US East could not be served out of the US. The user data was not shared. All of the recommendations weren't shared. Um, really, it was really effectively two different Netflixes which was fine until Christmas Eve 2012, where Amazon had an ELB outage, um, and half of Netflix customers were not able to watch Netflix for, I forget, hours. Um, the part that really sucked about this was this was completely outside of our control. We had no power to fix it. Uh, we, couldn't our we couldn't tell our customers it was Amazon's fault because they still couldn't watch Netflix. That didn't help them. Um, so this started our project of regional resiliency. So we launched in a third region um, in US West 2. Um, and after lots of work, we built it in such a way that if there was an issue in one of these US regions, we could fail over traffic from the failing region into a healthy region. So to, to limit the impact of the problem region on the Netflix customers. Um, and more recently, um, we started, we finished the Global Cloud Initiative, um, and now EU is involved in that too. So any Netflix user can be solved out of any region. Um, uh, so yeah. Why is failing over so hard? As a rule, we run lean in each region uh, to save on cost. We don't want to run at full capacity to serve all Netflix users in all regions. That's a very large waste of resources. Um, 
So one of the first things we do when we perform a failover is we scale up. There is, a, there is an art to scaling up, to moving traffic. Um, if we scale up and move traffic too slowly, the customers that are having a sucky time are having a much longer sucky time. Um, if we move too fast, we could bring down the region that is healthy that we're trying to bring them to and compound the problem and make a sucky experience for twice as many Netflix customers. Um, if we, while we're scaling up, we wait for an alert, by that point, um, we have already caused the problem. Um, we'd want to try to figure it out before we get to that problem. Um, so failover gets even more complex now uh, that we have the three regions, because we're now failing over users from one bad region into two healthy regions. So now we have to pay attention to all of the metrics and the idea of, is it healthy to receive traffic in two simultaneous three regions? Um, how can we figure this out? This is a representation of the microservice architecture in a single region. Um, I can't really reason if this region would be ready for more traffic. There's over 200 services. Um, how do you tell which ones are healthy? Um, if there's one that isn't healthy, is it an important service that really matters for the core Netflix experience? And imagine this is two regions. It, you'd have to look at two of these and try to figure out what's going on, look at the metrics for 400 different services. Um, so we need the idea to be able to feel instead of understand, because it's not really possible for one person to understand all 200 services, what their purpose is, and which ones are important. Um, so this here is a, one of our dashboards that shows global traffic entering Netflix um, with all of the important numbers blurred out. This, is, this, this dashboard has been extremely useful for researching after something goes wrong. When we get paged, we can look at the dashboard, see which region has the errors, what type of error, um, and that. There's a little, but, uh, yeah, and there's lots of extra information that is useful for triaging. Um, you're able to coordinate the time something went wrong, line it up with other graphs, and uh, lots of other very useful purposes for dashboards, but none that are useful in the moment while we're in the middle of doing a failover. Um, line charts show change. It's one thing they're very good at. We, like I said before, we are actually affecting the change. So we don't really care about the change. And you'll see every single line on these graphs change. So it'll take a long time to parse the graphs and figure out which one is the one that could be causing the problem. All that we care about is the now. Um, we don't need the historical. This is kind of a highlight of what on these graphs is important to us while we're doing a failover. So it's a lot of extra information that your eyes have to parse and your brain has to parse um, that is not important to us in the moment. Um, so yeah, we needed a better way to parse what is going on right now. These standard visualizations are very good for, for comparing and all that we care is can we move more traffic and can we move it now? This is a subset of graphs um, for all of the services. Um, in a single region, how can we parse this? There's some that are red that are going bad. Are those important? Are like if that fell over, it's one of those, the logging service. Do customers can be in a region if logging fails over. Um, okay, maybe we could sort this by amount of traffic. Logging gets probably more traffic than most and that would be near the top and we'd see it's red, that's not important. Um, some of these services, Shouldn't affect, the, shouldn't affect the streaming experience at all, but they take lots of traffic, or they're showing up red, or what does the red mean? This is, these could be 400s in the service owners that are all independent teams. They could have written their service in a way that serving a 400 is a valid response, and the service is actually being healthy. Um, we have no way of understanding every single service. So we needed a way to get kind of a, a gut feeling for the health of the service. So this started our process, our uh, brainstorming, which started with a pretty extreme example. We had the, we had the idea of a pain suit, um, where if you're on call, you wear a, a suit that has electrodes all over your body, and if you, start to feel, if you start to feel a pain in your pinky, you know that a service about user profiles is having some issues, and it's something you don't really use, so it's not that important, go back to bed. But the API service, that electrode's right on your heart. Wake up with a start, can't breathe, something's really wrong, you better go check and fix it 
so you, so you can get back to sleep. Pretty extreme example. Um, we laughed about it for a while, um, thought, are, are we actually being productive and getting work done, or are we just having fun? Um, but it really did get our brains moving, brains thinking, and to start thinking a little bit outside the box. So staying a little extreme, started thinking, we have five senses. Um, can you smell the health of a service? If, if, if a service stinks, does that mean that something's wrong with it? What do the different smells mean? Can you taste a service? Can you convince a group of engineers to taste things all day? Um, we quickly settled on visual. Um, it's something we're all trained to use. Um, we've all been looking at graphs, uh, some longer than others. And it is something that our brains are very good at. We're very good at parsing out shapes and colors out of massive amounts of data. Um, so going from there, we started the exploration, digging into normal, normal graphing types. Um, line graphs, bar charts, pie charts, and all of it's more or less the same. It's about relating numbers with each other or relating numbers over time. None of these are really specifically about looking at data in the now, looking at one set of numbers. Um, is this possible? So I'm gonna show you where we're at, what we built. Gotta tweak this a little bit, otherwise it's very choppy. This is currently what we have. Um, this is the global view. Um, these are all fake numbers, by the way. Um, we don't only have 100,000 RPS into Netflix. Um, the middle circle represents the internet, um, showing the RPS coming in and the error rate for that traffic. There are a lot of dots moving from the internet into the three surrounding circles, which each of those circles represent one of the Amazon regions that we are in. They're all labeled. The one on the left is US West, and then US East on the right, and EU West at the bottom. Um, one thing that's really nice about this view is it's fairly easy to tell the volume. Like you can tell in this demo that EU West is taking the most traffic. Or sorry, US East is taking the most traffic, EU West is next, and US West is trailing closely behind. The dots have colors, and at this resolution, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, but normal is blue. Uh, color theory shows blue is a very calm, neutral color. Um, so at quick glance, this looks normal. You don't get any weird feelings of, weird feelings of dread. Um, some of these dots that are hard to see, there are some reds and yellows in there. Um, in our case, red means that it was a response, that there was a request from a user that resulted in an error response, and there are some yellow dots that is a, a request from a user that resulted in a degraded response, where they did get a response, but somewhere down the line, they didn't get exactly what they asked for. Um, this is when, like, if you're watching Netflix on the list of movies, one of the rows is missing. That would be a response that would be a degraded response. Um, another thing that's really nice about this, this is actually showing more information than that, than that dashboard I showed you earlier that had the nine graphs. Um, each, each of those graphs had six lines on them. Um, this is showing you all the same information and more, and it's much easier to grasp what is going on. Um, if you've seen this before, like my, my, when I talked to Monodorama or elsewhere, there was text in the circles. I have since removed that because we're exploring more of the intuitive feel of just being able to see if the graphics do show. Um, you can hover and see it, so it tells you the exact RPS values. Um, and error rates for specific regions. But we are trying to stay away from the idea of exact number values, because especially at the scale we're at, exact number values are effectively meaningless. Um, we also added scaling information. Um, this bar here, which you can hover, shows if it's at, at the scaling level that we um, are desiring. Like this bar right here is showing that it's 74% of desired. Um, so at a quick glance, we can see if we were going to fail over into EU, it is not at the scaling state that we expect. So we probably shouldn't send more traffic yet. Um, then if you notice that one of these regions might have an issue, you see a lot of red dots going in, you have the ability to drill into a region. And this is the animated view of what I showed you earlier, which once we added the animation, it started to make things a lot more clear. Um, this has the same idea. Traffic is flowing in from the internet on the left. 
flowing into our, um, our edge services. Um, difference is the connections are one lane because they're more skinnier. Um, this is a custom layout algorithm that with my zero background in algorithms or layout, I wrote in a day. Um, Part of the reason is a lot of layout algorithms that exist for laying out graphs focus on grouping like nodes and not overlapping connections, which once you add the animation, um, overlapping connections was less important. It's still kind of confusing. Um, I would still like to work on it and have them overlap a little bit less, but it became less important. And grouping like nodes was not important because we are more, in, we are more interested in the flow of traffic. So in here, the traffic flows from left to right. Um, the same node coloring applies here. If the, or the, sorry, the traffic dot coloring applies here. Blue dots, normal traffic. Yellow dots, degraded. Red, air traffic. Um, there is also the idea of notices, which are the little circles inside the nodes to, to draw your attention that something might be happening. Commerce service is only 50% scaled. We know um, just based on its position, position in the flow, and the name of it, um, obviously we probably want people to be able to pay for Netflix. Um, so we will not scale up, we will not move traffic over here until this is appropriately scaled up. Um, we also added a contextual panel. So once you're like, okay, something's weird going on here, dig in a little deeper. Has some information about it, tells you the notices, has more details about the scaling status, the different clusters, this was filled in with a word randomizer, so I apologize if there's anything inappropriate showing up here. Um, gives you details about all the different clusters that that node makes up, and we added integration into the tools that gets you to the dashboards, the Atlas, um, which is our metrics collection telemetry platform and dashboarding system. Um, so you can dig into, now that you know where the problem is or where you actually want to look, now you can look at the single set of graphs. And, or you can go into Spinnaker, which is our deployment tool, um, so you can see the this, this state, this state of the deploy. Are we, we get more details about the scale up and why it's at the state it's at. Um, we're purposely staying away from a lot of those details here because we don't want to overload um, the person using this with information that is not necessary for the task at hand. Then there is a third view where you can zoom in even further. This is definitely the least built out built out so far. It's already proven useful when doing chaos exercises, because when we're injecting failure in the system at a specific connection or a specific node, it's nice to be able to only focus on that and get the rest of the noise out of the way. Um, we recently added, you can now focus on a connection, because there are inf is information about connections that will prove useful. This is even less built out. I just got this in Monday. Um, so it'll show we have Hystrix commands, which is one of our open source projects for uh, fallbacks. So you can check if, if fallbacks are performing appropriately um, and if that's why things are looking red. Um, I think that's it for the demo. All right, so how, do we, how did we build it? First, the UI side, uh, we iterated. We started with D3. D3 is very powerful, probably could have worked. I got really confused. Um, it's pretty confusing to use. Um, maybe if I spent more time with it, it would have worked out fine. Um, but we were trying to move fast. And D3 has a lot of client-side transformations for your data. And when we're trying to animate traffic in real time, uh, we only have 16 milliseconds to do any calculations on the browser before it will cause jank. Um, and I wanted performant animations. So I thought about, I quickly moved to using something in WebGL to move a lot of the, co of the visual computation off of the CPU. Um, started with the Pixel library. I worked at Adobe for seven years. The Pixel library is very heavily influenced by the Flash API, so I ran very quickly. Um, so then I moved on to the th to 3JS, which uh, it w we ended up st sticking with. Uh, provides a much more bare metal WebGL. I can write my own shaders. Um, and it provides kind of an object model on top of the way WebGL works. Uh, it's, it's a lot more performant and easy to use. Um, backend, for our personal backend, we used Node um, to do all of our data, data collection. We query Atlas 
for um, all of the telemetry data um, that we need. We use SALP, which is our project loosely based on Google's Dapper white paper uh, to figure out the dependency tree. Um, and then the node server does a lot of combinations and math to eliminate um, the exact metrics, combine it into more of the pseudo metrics that we use for the visualization, and generates the needed JSON structure for the UI. I'm going to show you a quick, very sped up demo of performing a traffic failover using this tool. Um, this is using a slightly older version of Visceral, um, but it still gets the point across. So this is um, normal state, traffic flowing into all three regions. Um, you'll start to see there's some errors happening in US East, so a traffic team gets on. We start to scale up. Um, scale up the other two regions so that we can uh, serve the traffic of the users that are being affected in East. Um, and soon here, yeah, you'll see we start to proxy some of the users over out of US East into the other two regions. Again, this is a slow process. We have to slowly scale up um, and slowly proxy traffic as we're scaling up. And at some point, you'll notice as soon as the maximum, num the maximum traffic is being sent to both regions. We can then flip DNS, which we can't flip at first because we'll just overwhelm the other regions and all of Netflix will fall over. So right there, we flip DNS. Um, now traffic is effectively being sent directly to the two safe regions while engineers are working on US East, getting it back up, figuring out what was wrong. Um, now we can do, this th do it back in reverse. Flip DNS again. So it's all the traffic is still being proxied out of East. So East, most of East is not taking any traffic. Most of the services, just our proxy service. And slowly dial back the proxying until we eventually get back to a, 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 a steady state. Um, this one view has already proven extremely useful for us in catching problematic states during failovers before we affect customers. Because um, it lets us kind of understand the inner workings of what we are doing in the, in the Knobs were, knobs were twisting and switches were flipping. Um, being able to see it uh, definitely helps us get a much better understanding of what we are actually affecting. Um, even building this tool with only failovers in mind, uh, it's already proven useful for our incident response teams during incidents, migration efforts for switching server types, even, uh, and even our onboarding team with new employee um, education on understanding the Netflix stack. And other people at Netflix have used this in their talks to explain the Netflix stack. Um, all that in mind, everything that we've learned internally for its use, uh, we open sourced the UI bits of it. Um, we believe, hope, and have already seen many other infrastructures and companies that can use it. Um, there's still definitely a lot of work, as I said earlier. Uh, I wrote the layout algorithm, so if someone who understands layout algorithms could write a new one, that would be awesome. Um, the third view, I'm going to be working on that to make that a lot more useful. Well, there's a lot of other views that we're going to be building, supporting layering, being able to have history playback, um, so you can compare it to a different time in, time in the past. And we've, we've already seen it help. Um, we feel at this point that other people can get help from it. Um, with the UI, you effectively pass it a JSON structure that we have a definition for, and it does the rest. Um, I am still actively working on it. A couple other people are still actively working on it. We're just going to start to do it out in the open. Other examples, one guy on my team just last week did a failover, um, realized he didn't really understand how our DNS rules were set up while he was doing the failover, so we quickly threw together um, a visualization on top of Visceral that shows our DNS records and the traffic, where the traffic is flowing based on the DN DNS records. Um, so when, when we do failovers, we can better understand where we're sending uh, people at the DNS level. Um, someone, already, someone outside of Netflix that I have no idea who he is, um, already built a prototype of Intuition as a service for Docker infrastructures, that if you just point your Docker infrastructure at whatever he's building, you'll get this visualization of the traffic between your containers. Um, We've made it very easy. I created a visceral example um, repo and also created a visceral React wrapper and a web component wrapper. If you have either of those systems set up, very easy to integrate. Um, visceral example, if you want to get it up and running with fake data, it's extremely simple. Clone it, install it, run it. 
and it just works. Special thanks to Jeremy Tattleman. He is a UX designer that, have helped, that has helped me polish this quite a bit to make it as pretty as it is. Lou Kusevsky, who I mentioned earlier, he helped with the original backend prototype um, and is one of the masters of the failover system. Um, that's it. That's Visceral. Thank you.